Yeah, hello, uh, my name is Andres and I'll be talking about collectivification and communicative need today. Uh, I am now a postdoc at the Cultural Data Analytics Lab at Tallinn University. Uh, and this work started when I was still in my PhD uh, in the Center for Language Evolution at the University of Edinburgh. So this is very much uh, collaborative work uh, together with my previous supervisors, uh, Rich Plight, uh, Kenny Smith and, and Simon Kirby, but also our um, uh, previous master student, Tian Yu Wang, who, who ran some of these uh, experiments. So, uh, oh, and also I'm uh, happy to take also questions on Twitter. If there's not enough time in the question session, there's a thread uh, if you go to my profile. Right, so the big picture. All living languages keep changing, like all the time. And they might change enough, and they often do, that they diverge into different languages. And when you think about it though, it's kind of weird. Like, wouldn't it be nice if, if everybody just spoke the same language, neighbors could speak to each other, everybody understood each other, and, and the world might be a different place. But this is not how human language works. And I'm interested in why. In particular here, I'm interested in lexical variations of words. Um, I mean, it's in variation and therefore also change. Um, but in particular, why are some semantic domains more complex than others? Why are some languages very specific about something, whereas others are vague? And the hypothesis is that, among other things, uh, one reason is probably communicative need. Uh, communicative needs differ between language communities. How would we study this? Well, we could look into diachronic corpora, obviously. Um, and the, if you do that, you get more the picture on the population level. Uh, you could do that uh, just by counting frequencies or also modeling meaning using um, uh, distribution of semantics, which is something I've also done. Uh, but here, um, I'm more interested in, the, in testing causal claims uh, about individual level processes. And this is something you can test using human experiments. Um, now you can't, or it would be very difficult to test uh, actual languages or actual language evolution in the lab. Uh, so, but what we can do is instead is use artificial languages. So basically take a bunch of people, put them in a box and force them to learn, learn some ridiculous sounding words. Um, but don't worry, we had ethics clearance for that. So uh, I'm gonna start with some very, very basic concepts because I want everybody to be on the same page about these things. So imagine a semantic space of a language. It has a bunch of meanings in it, um, and there are some words which lexify some of these meanings. Here, for example, we have a slice of the space. So let's call it the meaning or a concept. And we have a word that lexifies that meaning. So maybe the concept is frozen water, and the word lexifying that is ice. If we have another word that pretty much means the same thing, we call it synonymy. We might also have different meanings. And in some cases, there is one word for each meaning. But in other cases, um, we have something called uh, collectification, which is just one word referring to two or more meanings. Now, you might ask, uh, how, how do we know that there are more than, more than one meaning? Well, one way people have done this is by comparing lots and lots of languages and figuring out that, yes, it is indeed possible to slice this meaning into multiple meanings because some languages do it, where some don't. Another way of, of looking at it is through uh, the framework of complexity and information loss. And, and this has been proven quite fruitful in the, in the recent years. So complexity here means just not simple in the case of lexicons, so just many words. Um, and if you have many words, you incur cognitive cost because you have to learn them and memorize them. Uh, information loss refers to ambiguity. So if you're ambiguous, um, then um, you're not expressive and, and you incur uh, communicating cost. Uh, cost as in you might miscommunicate and be misunderstood, uh, which can lead to bad things. So in the case of if you have one word for one meaning, then you have a bit more complexity because you have to remember two meanings, right? But you don't have ambiguity. In the case of collectification, you, you get a bit simpler language because you don't have to remember this one word, but now you're ambiguous. You could also logically have the situation where you have two words referring to two meanings and you don't know, don't know which is which, so it's, it's like twice as bad. Uh, but incidentally, what people have shown 
in the past is that languages, natural languages, tend to try to avoid this situation. Um, so, and this is how we get to the optimal front. So people have shown that languages tend to, on these two axes of communicative cost and co cognitive cost, they tend to fall on the optimal front and, and tend to avoid the situation where you would have both complexity and information loss. So in this schematic, uh, real languages are meant to be blue and hypothetical languages are meant to be gray. And this is probably a plot that many of you have seen at least some in somewhere in some paper, uh, because quite a few people have used this framework to describe lexicons in the world languages, for example, kinship terms, uh, color, numeral systems, and, and other things. And, and the result tends to be always the same, uh, which is that natural language is somewhere along this optimal front. But then it's the question like, how, how, how does a language decide where to be on the optimal front? Because there are many ways to be optimal. And um, there's one idea, um, which is that it depends on communicating. So if you have low communicating need, let's say kinship terms are not really important in your language community, then people are happy to have a language that is more ambiguous, but then you can have a simpler language, or in, at least in the subspace. Whereas if that is something very important to you, like kinship terms, we, it's really important who's who's relative, then you see languages which uh, sacrifice a bit of that simplicity, so they become more complex, but then you are more precise, you don't have information loss. And this is, this is where our paper comes in. So um, we tried to look at this experimentally. Um, this paper incidentally came out yesterday in Cognitive Science. Um, it was meant to be open access. Now it's not, but the preprint, which is the same basically, is, is still available, of course. Um, th and this paper follows directly from a cross-linguistic study from last year. Uh, by Xu et al, um, conceptual relations predict classification across languages. Uh, so basically, they took dictionary data essentially from more than 200 languages, and they show that similar and associated senses are more frequently co-lexified than unrelated or weakly associated senses. And when you think about it, it's it's quite intuitive. It's, it makes sense, but nobody has really looked at it as systematically. So it's it's a very neat result. So they say, okay, so similar senses are more frequently um, collexified. But in the end, they also say, well, but surely culture specific communicative needs should affect this. They should affect collexification. So, for example, if it is necessary for efficient communication to distinguish some meanings, uh, like, for example, fire, uh, like ice and snow in cold climates, which there is some literature on the people, there is actually a difference. Cold climates, people tend to have different words, warm climates, they often have a single word for ice and snow. If you, if you have the, some communicative need, that might block your sort of natural drive to collexify similar meanings. Now, we're wondering, so can we describe the cognitive mechanisms um, that lead to these cross-linguistic tendencies? Maybe we can even test these two claims about collexification um, experimentally. Uh, and we did. So what, what we constructed here is a dyadic communication game setup. Uh, so it's two players uh, sending uh, messages to each other to take turns being the sender and the receiver. And they're trying to guess and con uh, what the other is saying and kind of construct a little language. And this is something that has been done before. So we basically took ideas from previous research to do that. Uh, we have two conditions. One is these are a neutral condition and a target. And you'll see in a second what this means. Uh, the, the, the average game takes about half an hour or so. Uh, it's 135 rounds of sending back and forth. And in total, we conducted four of these experiments, uh, including a self-replication. So this is, this is what uh, uh, one game looks like. Um, we told them that they're spies and they have to send secret messages. Um, that, that's the framing. Uh, and every time they take turns, so let's say here player one is being the sender, they see two concepts, two meanings on the screen. Uh, both of them see the same, uh, but then the sender has to pick a signal to, to signal that meaning. At the same time, player two is looking also at the same meanings, so they know it has to be one of these two. It might be in a different order, but it's, it is two. 
And then uh, the sender sends a signal, and then the receiver has to guess. Um, is it this one or is it this one? So the baseline guessing is always 50 50. But over the course of the game, uh, mostly they come up with some system. Um, to give you an idea of what the sim stimuli looks like, um, we generated a bunch of these possible languages, uh, but there's 10 meanings in each game. Uh, these are taken from the Simlex 999 um, data set of human similarity judgments. So this makes it easy for us to control for similarity because we want to have distractor meanings. Here in this case would be a warrior theft state of rhythm, which are dissimilar to all other meanings. But then we also want to have these target meanings, which form similarity pairs. There's three of them. In this case, is task and job, similar meanings, but dissimilar to all others. Pair and couple, similar, but dissimilar similar to all others. And when we need this is, uh, so in the baseline condition, all of these pairs, like task and job, job and pair, pair and couple, pair and rhythm, whatever, they occur uniformly. There's exactly the same number of pairs, uh, combinations occurring throughout the experiment that they have to uh, give signals to. Whereas in the target condition, which is what we're interested in, uh, similar meanings occur together more often. So task and job is something they have to distinguish a lot, whereas task and rhythm or rhythm and state, they, they barely have to distinguish. So this is how we uh, simulate communicating meaning. And there's seven signals in each, each of these experiments, except for the last one. Um, and these are basically just uh, two syllable nonsense words that uh, we controlled, we generated in a way that they're controlled to be uh, dissimilar in form, both to all other signals, but also to the English language meanings that we used. So we made sure that the form of the signal does not bias uh, the lexic lexification choices. Here's a result, Here's a result of one game. Uh, this is obviously cherry picked to look nice uh, because they have 96% guessing accuracy. This was like a very, very good diet. Most of them are much more messy. Uh, but in that case, uh, this diet, uh, they co lexified shore and coast, for example. These numbers in these boxes mean just how many times the signal was used to signal that meaning. So they decided kuto means shore and coast. Uh, but then again, for rhythm, they decided that it gets its own unique signal, which happens to be Mumi. How to analyze this data? We, we thought of a few different ways, but uh, in the end, um, well, what was important was also to capture changes over time, because most diets are not neat like this. They actually change preferences sometimes over the course of the game. So what we came up with is this. Um, first of all, we, we exclude lower accuracy diets, because some of them are just pressing random buttons. So we kick those out. Uh, and then the process is basically we iterate through each game log. We record each instance of classification. Uh, so same one signal used for two different meanings. Um, and this re yields us a data set uh, in the case of experiment one of uh, over 1000 data points. And then, so it's, it becomes a binary question like, is it classified or not classified or not? Um, and then we feed this data set into a logistic mixed effects regression model. Um, and what we're asking uh, is, does condition predict likelihood of uh, collectification? We also include an interaction with the uh, round number, because again, we want to control for uh, changes over the course of the game. And what we're asking the model is, are similar meanings less likely to be collectified in the target condition? Because remember, in the target condition, they have actual communicative need to distinguish them. So they, they shouldn't want to uh, collectify. The answer to that question is yes. So in experiment one, there's a difference between conditions. Uh, in the baseline condition, when there is no pressure to distinguish particular meanings, uh, participants prefer to collectify similar meanings. So like task and job. And this supports the main cross-linguistic finding of Shu et al. 2020. But in the target condition, when need arises to distinguish similar meanings, uh, speakers are indeed less likely to collectify them. Uh, in this plot and the next plots, uh, it's uh, what is plotted here is each style's probability to collectify target meaning pairs uh, by the end of the experiment. 
So that's great. These results support the hypothesis that communicative need may block classification of related concepts. But we were not quite satisfied with this one result. So we self-replicated this experiment. Um, the first experiment was done using a student sample. Uh, but then since it was in the middle of a pandemic, we, we switched to Mechanical Turk, uh, which does provide more flexible recruitment, but also much more noise. So the, the Mechanical Turk people are, they just a lot of the time press random buttons, but the result does replicate. We ran two more experiments. Um, the third one, we basically just made them, made it even easier for them to collectify uh, the distractor pairs. Um, because in the original one, they were by design, if they wanted to avoid collectifying the target pairs, they would have to collectify some very unrelated ones. We thought they would actually give us a stronger effect, but it didn't make a difference. It still replicates the difference between the baseline and the target condition. Um, and finally, this is uh, first and foremost, the sanity check. Um, we conducted a whole another experiment with two conditions, but in this one, we gave them 10 meanings and 10 signals. So in, remember, in the first ones, uh, there were only seven signals. So they were forced to collectify something just by design. Whereas here, if they want to learn 10 signals, they can just use one signal for each meaning. And indeed, the difference between the conditions disappears. Um, I guess it's not that hard to learn 10 signals if you already were OK with learning some signals. But when you think about it, this makes a lot of sense because um, Natural languages do have pressure to simplify. You cannot have infinite lexicons. So what we're simulating here with like the seven signals and 10 meanings is, is more natural uh, because there is a pressure to keep a lexicon manageable. Anyway, so that's that's all experiments. We there was in total about yeah, 173 diets were used and well, some more <laughs> who were discarded. Um, but now in the last few minutes, I want to zoom out um, because I want to get back to the idea of complexity and information loss. So could we could we link these results to these uh, previous prosthetic results which are in this framework? Uh, and I think we can. So here's a different coding of the results. This is experiment one. Um, so this is different from the coding that we used for the stats. Uh, this is probably not good for stats, but it's good for exploration. So what I did here basically is I coded qualifications as increasing ambiguity. So one qualification plus one ambiguity, and uh, but also um, reducing complexity. Whereas if you have separate signals for separate meanings, then you get more complexity. And indeed, this picture replicates what is often seen, but all the time seen in cross-linguistic studies, where if there's uh, they are well, first of all, they're all towards the optimal front or here optimal points, but then communicative need does make a difference. The baseline ones are here where it's, they're a bit more ambiguous, but uh, therefore simpler. Whereas if you have communicative need to distinguish things, then you, you pay the complexity price. So conclusions. Um, what we describe here is uh, an individual level uh, lexical choice, choice mechanism, which produces results in line with typological collectification tendencies from previous literature, but also supports the communicative need hypothesis. So for more details, again, check out the paper. Uh, I have also work in progress of applying that same idea to um, diachronic corpora using word embeddings. But the big picture is that we didn't, we didn't uh, check for change, we didn't model change in the experiment, but the way I see these results support the idea that in actual, language change. When languages shift along the optimal front, this is, among other things, guided by community need, which may stem from social, cultural, environmental, and other factors. Or to put it more bluntly, maybe languages change because people need them to change. But then, and that's the final point, um, if you think of language as product of cumulative cultural evolution, would this framework of complexity and information loss, would it be also applicable to other products of cumulative cultural evolution? And I think it should be. And this is incidentally something I've been working with now here uh, together with many colleagues at the Cultural Data Analytics Lab. Uh, namely, we are working on quantifying aesthetic complexity in visual art. 
uh, of course, with the prospect of, of applying the um, complexity or the cognitive cost and communicative cost framework to uh, things like art and, and other things. Anyway, I'm all this time. Thank you very much for listening.